was a document produced in 2014 at a conference, the, and it's called the Oxford Declaration of Freedom of Thought and Expression because it was done in Oxford at a big congress, so this is a, 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 an international human uh, uh, congress. And it came up with six principles about on the issues of freedom of thought and expression. And I think they're pretty good. So let's just share them. Firstly, the right to freedom of thought and belief is, is one and the same, and it's true for everyone. So there isn't really any difference. You, you know, we, nobody can control your thoughts, and therefore they can't control your beliefs. Secondly, no one anywhere should ever be forced into or out of their beliefs. And this very much ties with what Ali has just been talking about. This is about freedom of or belief as a particular example of that, but it could be a political belief as well. This was because it was an international uh, conference, the right of freedom of expression is global in its scope. In other words, you can, you, know, um, uh, you can express something here and it should be available to somebody in Iran or vice versa. Key one, of course, there's no right not to be offended or to hear contrary opinions. And, you know, as uh, Rabia said uh, at the beginning yesterday, you know, part of this conference is to experience this. You know, I went to a session yesterday where I found myself sort of disagreeing profoundly, and that was probably very healthy. Um, states mustn't ex uh, restrict thought of expression merely to protect the government from criticism. Right now, the government is holding back the report about the Home Office and the Windrush scam. And it's purely to avoid embarrassment. You know, that's not what should be happening. And the key thing, freedom of belief is absolute, but freedom to act on belief isn't. And obviously, sometimes that's because we may restrict the freedoms of other people. Um, now, the UK has a Human Rights Act. I I have a horrible feeling we'll be hearing a lot more of that in the, in the news over the next five years, um, which puts actually a number of other restrictions on it. For instance, you know, we, um, you know, there's a reputation of the rights of others. We have libel laws in this country, and I think rightly so. You know. There's also national security. You can't go on Twitter and put the nuclear codes on Twitter. You know, that's illegal. So there's some sensible things, things about that. More relevant, though, to what we're talking about here, is the Racial and, uh, and Religious Hatred Act, an act in 2006. And it makes it an offence to use, and I'll read this, but threatening words, to use threatening words or behaviour if intended to stir up religious hatred against a group of persons defined by reference to religious belief or lack of religious belief. Okay. So it means everybody in this room including me, are protected by Fides. So the key test is intention to stir up hatred towards people. And actually there's quite a fine people part of that. But it also goes on to, to add something. It says, nothing here shall be read or given effect in a way which prohibits or restricts discussion, criticism, <coughs> expressions of antipathy, dislike, ridicule, insult, or abuse of particular religions or belief, or practices of their adherence, or proselytizing, or urging adherents of a different religion or belief system to cease practicing the religion or belief. Okay, so in other words, the annoying preacher on the street corner who's you know instructing us to come to Jesus has the right to do that. You know, and personally, I think I would like to defend his or her rights. So, in other words, kind of like we have no right not to be offended. Now, of course, there is a right, the, the candidate to that, to express offence, to say, I'm really offended by that, you know, <coughs> and to criticise the person that causes it. And there is a, there's also a right, of course, to argue that when people uh, express criticism of a religion or, or mock of a mock of religion, actually they're doing it in a way which is deliberately done in order to stir up religious hatred. And if you can prove that, you know, that then falls within the terms of the law. So, now overall, so the law here broadly does meet most of these uh, principles, a bit dodgy on fire. Um, but the key thing about it is, its aim is to protect, protect beliefs. It doesn't protect beliefs. We don't have a blasphemy law in this country. Anyone know when, when that was abolished, by the way? 
It was under the Tony Blair government. It was. It was March that year, 2006, I think. Yeah, 2000, it was. It was 2008. Right. <laughs> much more recent than you think. Now, the cases that are more instructive on this are the ones, of course, that lie on, on the boundaries. And the most recent example of that is the case of, it was actually a French example, is Mila. People know the case of Mila? This is a French teenager. And uh, she was rude about Islam and the Quran. And she was streaming a video on Instagram, okay? And she got into an argument with a Muslim internet user who made unwanted advances to her. And after a heated exchange, and I, I blanked out what she said, so to protect your sensibilities, but it was quite rude about this stuff. Interestingly, though, the very first thing she said was, I hate religion. Then she went on to be insulting about the Quran and this stuff. Um, now, and, um, she received numerous death threats as a result of that. And she's actually been forced, she's 16, she's been forced to move her uh, school. But she then, she confirmed, as she was on TV, she then said, I, I wanted to be blasphemous. I wanted to speak out about religion, to say what I thought. She describes herself as an atheist, she's a very, very hard on atheist. But she added, I've always been able to differentiate between a religion and the people who practice it. And she made it clear she wasn't attacking Muslim people at all. Now, of course, getting death threats for this sort of thing plays exactly into the hands of the far right. Marine Le Pen was all over this case. And from the perspective of, of an outsider who likes to, wants to see a peaceful, plural society with Muslims making a, you know, a constructive and positive contribution to this, you know, the response to a teenage outburst was astonishingly stupid. You know, it was a really bad idea. Now, this leads to another, more, another point which I suspect may be controversial in this room. <coughs> and I'm assuming that we all agree that anti-Muslim prejudice and hatred is a significant issue. In this, in this country, and as if uh, to um, underline that, as I was on the train in the way, the way in, I picked up a tweet which was from a guy called, called um, sorry, I just lost it, um, David Vance, and he retweeted somebody from somebody in UKIP who was saying uh, they're shutting down uh, mosques in Slovakia, abandoning the burqa in some other country. Shouldn't we do the same? And he tweeted that, he got 3,000 likes, and if you read through the responses, they're terrible. So we have a problem, don't we? You know, we all know we've got a problem. Um, but the Mila case illustrates the dangers of using, it's me, these, use, illustrates the dangers of using the term Islamophobia to refer to that problem. Um, and in particular, to me, it gives, it, it, it gives the, a problem with the attempt to define that as a type of Islamophobia as a type of racism that targets expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. That's the proposed definition. A type of racism that targets expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. Now, Mila is a hardline atheist. Her views on Christianity are probably exactly the same as they are on, on, on Islam. Um, but there's no evidence that she is actually a bigot against people who, who are Muslim. In fact, she explicitly says she's not. And it was about beliefs, or probably her rather ill-informed view of uh, uh, Islam, um, which was this about. And unlike the death threat she got, it's perfectly legal, legal to express those in this room. But is it Islamophobic to express those views? Well, actually, if we take that word literally, it is. Because it's, you know, you could say it's an irrational dislike um, of Islam. But it isn't about people. So the problem with the term, to me, the problem with the term Islamophobia is it conflates criticism of people and um, criticism of, of, of ideas. And the danger of the proposed definition is that in the hands of a clever lawyer, a British teenager, <coughs> saying uh, what Mina said, if this became our definition, could be labelled a racist. And what the effect of that would be blasphemous remarks like hers, currently legal could be effectively become illy. Now, of course, we've got to challenge uh, bigotry. I've reported the tweet to Twitter and everything. And of course, we've got to make use of the laws of tackle racism. But I think we should also resist playing with definitions which could lead, intentionally or not, to blasphemy or coming back 
in my back door. And among other things, that would place ex Muslims in an impossible position. For some of them, and Ali has made her position clear, but for some of them, ability to criticize the Quran, ability to criticize um, expressions of Muslimness, if you've been forced to uh, address in a certain way and you, that's the sort of thing that you rebel against, can be an important part of people's identity, their new identity, um, and may be part of the way they come to terms with and excuse the abuse they've, they've experienced. So the whole, this whole issue about definition to me is a distraction from the big problem, which is a severe problem of anti-Muslim bigotry and hatred, which we all fight against. Um, now, up to now, we've been talking about limits imposed by the law. Um, and when they're attacked, I think we should defend them. I was the one of the people who went online and said, just we Charlie, when the Charlie Hebdo thing ha happened. Not that I would ever buy a Charlie Hebdo magazine, I think it was appalling and aggressive and stuff. But most of the time, actually, we're not bumping up against those people's limits. So how, what about the non-legal space, when we're inside the, the, the rules? Now, one area I think we haven't got to grips with yet is um, social me media. And the key issue here is that social media muddies the boundaries between the right of any organisation to say, I'm not going to give a platform to somebody we don't, we don't approve, approve of, uh, and censorship. And let's take an example of somebody I guess we all know, Katie Hopkins. Okay? <coughs> Anybody here not know Katie Hopkins? <coughs> Now, bigoted self publicist now. Uh, now, she was sacked as a presenter on LBC, because she had her own program, for making a horrible you know, anti Muslim uh, remark. And you know, everyone was very pleased. Um, and in January uh, this year, uh, she was boosted off Twitter as well. And, um, and apparently, that was, she made lots of other anti Muslim remarks, but apparently, that particular one was because she told Stormzy that white men have a harder time in modern Britain than black men like him. <laughs> now, you know, but it provoked this reaction from Brendan O'Neill. Now, Brendan O'Neill isn't somebody I normally find myself uh, agreeing, agreeing with, but he did make me think, you know, refusing somebody a platform at the village hall is one thing. You know. um, deciding to chuck somebody off a radio station is also fine, you know. How the hell did she get a radio program in the first place anyway? Um, but there are 300 million users of Twitter. That's a lot of people. And there's a limited choice of people, platforms. They're all run by commercial companies, so they can do what they want. So even though it felt good to me that Twitter had booted her, her off, because I hate that, I think she's horrible. That's a lot of power in the hands of a very small number of people. And I think, you know, this is the point, the point uh, that he was making. And as it happens, uh, they let her back in. Okay, this was much more, more recent. Now, our government is talking about forcing social media companies to act to protect their users. Now, when it comes to some of the things that have been going on, uh, you know, that content which leads children to harm themselves or commit suicide, terrible stuff going on, surely that's a good thing. You know, uh, very hard to get. It could, though, if it's not done right, lead to social media giants just saying, we're going to play everything safe. Okay. You know, anything remotely controversial could be said. And is that what we want? Now, in some cases, there aren't any easy answers. For example, in this case, Censorship could have actually saved a life. Don't anti vaxxers have the right to freedom of expression? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we need something to be the pain of the body to look at this. Recently, of course, the, the courts have drawn a firm line, and I think will combine on one thing, which was to say, you know, they are they are saying you do have free speech. Um, I guess you're familiar with this case, this is the transphobic case, and this is one of the, the, the tweets that's going to bring out. Okay. So whatever you think of, uh, you know, personally I support the rights of trans people and, uh, and they're treated unkindly in many, many ways, but he has a right to save the things. 
Now, as I said, the six principles of the Oxford Declaration, which we started, started with, are about the law. But I'd like to suggest a seventh one, going to become last, the social media one. That with the right to freedom of expression comes the responsibility to use it wisely, and if we can, use it kindly. And that's not always easy. Um, and at the time of Charlie Hebdo, there was a lot of talk about self censorship. None of the British newspapers, who were so strongly supportive of the rights of uh, which I had published for the first time, none of them actually published the magazine, the, the um, cartoons. A lot of people condemned that as cowards. They said the threat of violence as, as well. Now, if I were a newspaper editor, I wouldn't want to be responsible for some of my staff being murdered in, you know, outside the office. Um, that wasn't the only reason not to publish it. It was the cartoons were deliberately inflammatory. Um, on the other hand, I might feel the duty to my readers to show them what the fuss was about. It doesn't take much to find that. Um, on balance, I think it was probably right not to publish them, but they could have provided a link online to so if you want to look at them. It's a judgment call, it's not easy. And when it comes to journalism, and writing in general. self censorship is, I think, is something we ought to worry about, especially if it's influenced by fears of violence or government action that goes beyond the law through surveillance. But at a personal level, we, you know, it's very easy for me to say, you know, self censorship bad thing. Most of us, I don't know about you, I was taught as a child, somebody gives you a birthday present and you don't like it, you say thank you and you, ex you do your best to express pleasure. Okay. If my wife says, ask my opinion on the dress that she's just worn and spent the afternoon choosing, it, there is only one answer. <laughs> and um, and you know, we, do, we self censor all the time because it's kind, it's polite, it's the way we get on. You know. Now, um, the playwright uh, Arnold Wesker, now deceased, wrote a helpful piece in, in the magazine called New Humanist when, uh, back in 2002, because that was in the wake of the rush deal. And, and I think it, it, I found this quite a helpful analysis. When you're talking about offence or blasphemy, he came up with three sort of categories. They're slightly overlapping, but they're useful. Um, and, and these are the three. He said that there, there's gratuitous, calculated, and unavoidable types of blasphemy or offence. And this, this is a quote. Gratuitous offence is, is mindless, <coughs> it's an or insensitivity. It's linked with mindless violence. Calculated offence describes itself. The intention is clear and deliberate, and aims to achieve a well-defined result, and that result is hurt. Um, it's aimless, it's spitting at someone's feet, daubing a swastika on a Jewish grave, that sort of, of stuff. Um, the tricky one is unavoidable. And the example he gives is from uh, one of his plays. So there's a character in one of his plays called Shiloh, uh, who expresses the view that Abraham invented God. Okay. Now, personally, as a humanist, I also think that, that um, man created God rather than the other way around. Now, obviously, that's a blasphemous view from the point of view of, of any follower of, of an Abrahamic faith. Uh, now, I'm sorry if anybody finds that, that offensive, but I'm just expressing my belief. So, unless I'm going to be forbidden from expressing my belief, that offence is unavoidable. And that's what he meant by unavoidable offence. Um, and of course, that would be forbidden in a number of other, other countries, but thank you. Now, the, the, uh, obviously, neither goes in, in, in uh, that category. Um, gratuitous offence is almost always uh, undesirable. Calculated offence can sometimes be justified. You know, Charlie Hebdo was sued lots of times by the Catholic Church. Here's one of their milder cartoons. Okay? He defiled bishops, you know, and the advice and the confessional is we'll just make films like the okay? So this is. They, they were constantly attacking each other. Now, but that was in the context of an institution that remains a powerful influence in French society, 
how he reflects a battle between the secular and the, and the, the, the church, which is going back to the French Revolution. <coughs> now, like it or not, all three of those types of effects will inevitably happen. So the next question, and the final question I'm going to deal with, is about the reaction to it. Everybody who's offended can express their effects. Okay? And that can and should point out where fruit where free expression is being used to punch down on the minority, such as French Muslims. Very different from the Catholic Church. As Vesca said, the problem here is zealotry. People are unable to cope with their emotional reaction to something they find offensive and who resort to violence or threats of violence. That surely is the enemy. As Mila found to her cost, there are some zealots amongst French Muslims. And you don't have to look too far to find zealotry among Christians, too. Anyone who's been involved with anti abortion movements has seen that. We've always had zealots. Every society has had them. You know, consider the witches of Salem, or the Rwandan genocide, or, you know, West Bank settlers, who's the kind of government right to be there. Followers of Tommy Robinson. Now, obviously, we can't begin to them. But I think we should be uh, educating ourselves and our coming <coughs> generations of being aware of simplistic black and white thinking, which is one of the key enablers of zealotry. And complexity requires mental effort. You need to think hard and a bit of emotional intelligence. Simplicity is easy. And you know, it's all over social media. And it feeds tribalism and I think dehumanization. Mm -hmm. I can't believe the people who sent death threats to Mila were thinking of her in the same category as their own daughter or close friend, or sister. We can't always agree, but we can learn to disagree better. So coming back to this, you know, back to where we started, I hope we can all agree on these six principles. And also with the right to free expression comes the responsibility to use it wisely, ideally kindly, and be prepared to hear things we don't.